Pan Pan Psychast. Part four: How to run a granary. <laughs> Just kidding. It's part four, further analysis and discussion, of course. There's loads of stuff we haven't had a chance to talk about. Uh, the role of women, some of the other Confucian scholars that come after Confucius, some more stuff on government, how to mm. live fulfilled life. Mm. So before we get into our criticisms, our positives of mm. Confucianism, our overall thoughts, our own overall analysis, let's unpack some of these other things. Do you want to kick us off, Andy? I would love to, and we're going to start this discussion with human nature. Ooh. Things. And we know that... <laughs> no, no, I'm genuinely excited. <laughs> now, we, we hinted that Confucius himself had, a, I think, a reasonably positive outlook on human nature. Mm. He was a firm believer that every single person could theoretically become a sage of all things, even would, though he said he'd never met one and, would, <laughs> and never did. Would but, you say he was more Rousseauian than Hobbesian? Andrew. I would absolutely say that, but I won't say it. Because <laughs> so, they weren't born yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a very, very long time. <laughs> Quote here from the Analects. Human beings are by nature similar, but they vary greatly from each other as the result of practice. Mm. So you, you, you can see how that goes. Everybody's born naturally to be, well, not necessarily good or bad, but somewhat neutral. And we have the ability to become good. And mm -hmm. it, through our upbringings and our environment, we might change courses very much so with other people. So that was his take. He didn't say an awful lot more than that. So that m meant that thinkers after him had to do a little bit more of the discussion because people were quite interested in this. As you can imagine, if you're if the whole philosophy is, well, people can become good mm -hmm. and everyone looks around and says, have you seen the warring states? <laughs> what do you think? People are awful. How do yeah. we make these people good? And that left Confucian scholars later to say, okay, this is what I think Confucius was saying. So one of those, maybe the most famous is Mencius, isn't yeah. it? Who gives the example of, I'm walking down the road, I come across many of the wells that mm. are in my village. I look down the well, well, and well there's a well, child. Well. Yeah, well, well, there's a child. Help me. I can't help but help <laughs> yes. the child. It's in my nature to feel pulled towards mm. the good act. I na I'm naturally disposed towards the good. Or, or as Mencius would say, is that it, Mencius didn't think that everyone would necessarily jump in and help, but everybody, or let's say the vast majority of people, would at least have the sentiment. So mm. I see a, a child in a well. My in instinct will instantly make me feel bad about that yeah. now i could then just say well not my problem and walk off and that means yeah. that i have not cultivated ren <laughs> well enough but i will at least have that emotion if you don't have that mencius and confucius would would argue as well is that you are lacking humanity mm. you are literally not human anymore because you cease to do the thing the loving thing towards your fellow human being mm. So, uh, yeah, and you just said just a quick little bit, bit of background here. Mencius is the only other Confucian scholar who we've been given a Latinized version of the name because mm. he was considered to be, again, I don't, we've done this a lot, but like without trying to make a comparison to Western culture, but I, I definitely remember reading that Mencius is seen as the Paul to, to the Confucian Jesus, as it were. So, <laughs> so the person, the person who a lot of people, a lot of people in the culture will uh, learn about Confucius through Mencius. Mm. Yeah. And, and in that sense, you could see the, the <laughs> this is really popular as well, isn't it? Na literally named after him. Yeah. I wonder if, so, Mencius says, I have an inclination towards the good, uh, therefore my human nature is good. Why does he say that I don't do this, just for clarity's sake? So when I walk away from the well, what reason would I have for doing that? Because I, I can see a criticism coming that if that is human nature as well, that shows that it's a mixed nature. I'm sure he's dealt with this very he, basic he, criticism. Right, yeah. So his his response to that is that all human beings have been endowed by heaven mm. with the seeds or what he calls like the sprouts of virtue. Ah. And he his analogy is kind of like a garden analogy where he says all human beings have been naturally have these sprouts and if they are watered and maintained properly we will grow into virtuous people and mm -hmm. the important thing there is is that the seeds are definitely there yeah. and that doesn't that does mean though that you could be born be raised by a, an awful farmer and your seeds don't grow and then you turn out to struggle to be a good person and maybe then you see the child in the well and that seed will still say like oh that 
isn't that really bad? And then you might just out of habit say, yeah, well, not my problem. Hmm. That seems to be hmm. somewhat plausible. Hmm. And he, he also makes a, a, a discussion about, he uses this example of a hill that used to have trees and that through the, the act of deforestation, uh, trees have been cut down. And now when people look at this hill, it looks like trees were never there. Yeah. But the fact is, is that the potential for the trees is still and was there and with the right cultivation you might be able to get the trees back so mm. even when we look at people and we think god that person's really bad it's because i can't see the trees the trees are all gone but there is still the seed there and it's still possible to to do that so he has very much a optimistic view of human nature mm. that all people can be redeemed all people can become good people mm. and that it, but let's be clear here he doesn't think this is an easy ride just because we have the natural tendency to be able to do this yeah. doesn't mean that we can th- then ignore all of the confusion rituals and stuff that we were talking about in the previous episode so that's that's really important Chunzi's got the opposite view after Confucius, another scholar who's who's really, really famous next to uh, Mencius. So something maybe we can talk about later, wouldn't you, from Pat Junji's viewers. For Mencius, after all the human nature stuff we've done on the show in the past, Hmm. do you think that we can have seeds for, can you run like a parody argument where we've got seeds for being apathetic or being you know, evil? Are we disposed towards laziness? Are we disposed towards gluttony? Are we disposed towards not caring about other creatures? Can, are we selfish? Are we hedonistic? Are we time biased? Like, it seems like you could run a parallel argument for lots of little things. He's picked his, he's, as he put the cart before the horse and just thinking. My take on this, and I might, I might be wrong here, but Mencius seems to say that those behaviors are the things that have been kind of corrupted in us. So, in, in a way, almost, let's, if we're continuing on this garden analogy, then maybe those seeds weren't there to begin with, but can be easily planted in the soil so it's not like it's clearly easy for us to turn the the bad path uh, and that just requires that extra vigilance to make sure that those are weeded out as yeah well. maybe you could use the the well example uh, the opposite right no one walks past the well and goes oh great a child stuck in a well brilliant there's there seems to be even in the you'd say the heart of the most heartless person mm. you would like to think they would at least be like oh well I, it would be better if that kid wasn't in that well. Mm. Um, I don't think many people would walk past and go, yeah, kids in wells. Yeah, they, uh, but good. I think that's what I was saying. He's picked his example well. So, if, <laughs> yeah, well, well, if, well. Sometimes when someone gets hurt, we laugh, we take pleasure in someone's pain. We can be so I'm saying, like, if there was another mm. example which yeah. didn't seem to be given to us by society, like Pinker's example and Better Angels of Our Nature, when soldiers describe sexual release from killing people Mm. they don't get that from society says the critic that's in their human nature so is that the seeds of goodness well it's a bit more complicated i'm just trying to layer in some of that there that leads us perfectly on to i think like turning our attention to shunsa then now shunsa is the the I guess the Hobbes to the Rousseau. He is the, although <laughs> maybe that's not quite right. Uh, Shunsa, I think, right. So if you, if you are a secular humanist, non religious person and you're not interested in all this revering heaven and the gods oh, stuff, this, yeah. <laughs> this then, mandate of heaven, then I think that you might warm to Shunsa more than any of the other Confucian thinkers because yeah. his general philosophy is one, heaven is there is no separation of heaven and earth all things is just the natural world Mm. he doesn't think that heaven has ordained us to be good and have these good seeds he doesn't think that heaven has asked us to try to live the best life he Mm. says that we do that because we we as human beings want to do this so Mm. it's very much more on the root of just it's a social construct that benefits us all and that's why we should do these rituals and do these things, not because it pleases the gods in any way or, or heaven. Mm. And so automatically is that perhaps that extra step of more of the humanist than Confucius or Mencius can ever lay claim to be. Also, I think his view on human nature is something that perhaps quite a lot of people will, will find ap- appealing because he's, he's said exactly what you've just said there about the accusation towards Mencius, which is mm. he, he thinks that human beings are born amoral. We don't have good seeds or bad seeds. We're equally as likely to to go bad or good, depending on the rituals and the upbringing that we get. And that we have to really try very hard to become good. In fact, he actually says, I mean, it's uh, it's quite funny because one of the chapters in his text is literally human nature is bad. But he, he just, <laughs> that sounds more <laughs> critical than it is. Perhaps it's a better way of saying it. human nature has the potential to be bad. And yeah. so he mm. takes that pessimistic approach. He says, if we're not really careful... 
people aren't going to just become good. These seeds don't exist, Mencius. They it might appear like that, but actually it, it requires a lot of hard work mm. to to become a better person. Mm. And on that note, then I think. He, he, it's interesting because both of them ultimately come to the same conclusion, which is, mm. well, how do we become good? We do the rituals and we do yeah. the... We the, do what do, Confucius we do, Yeah, we do what Confucius <laughs> says. But, <laughs> but he is, I think, I think he is, from the, from the secular modern perspective, I think when I was looking at Shunsar, I was like, actually, I suspect a very large amount of people will probably agree and yeah. say, yeah, people are largely amoral and we, we can come either way and we just need to invest our time and efforts into becoming better people. Are you on team Shunza? Andy? <laughs> I mean, if I have to pick a side, yes, I guess. <laughs> but he didn't have a cool garden analogy? <laughs> <laughs> One of the most interesting things I found in my research was a story by Lun Shun in 1918 called Diary of a Madman. It's a very short story, which I think you, you both cited was referenced as well. And it's coming at the dawn of the end of the Confucian rule and the exam systems and the, the dawn of the communist revolution in China. And it's an absolutely brilliant story. And I implore everybody listening to give it a read. You can just search uh, Diary of a Madman on and search PDF online. It's widely available. It'll probably take you 10 minutes to read. And what you've got is a brilliant story of a brother. If someone goes to see a brother, one of two, and the one brother translates the story to him and says, oh, okay, well, my brother went mad. He went crazy. And now he's not with us. I've got this diary if you want to read it. And then you read his diary entries. And in his diary entries, he's saying, everyone wants to eat me. Everybody in the world is trying to eat me. Mm. And so he's worried and he hears stories of people eating one another. And a doctor comes around to see him because he's, he's clearly gone mad. Uh, he says something like, um, make sure he he's eaten alone to his brother. He overhears him, obviously deluded. And it's clear from that. And then he thinks his brother's going to try and eat him. And the whole of society are there to try and eat one another. And uh, I'll give you a nice quote towards the end here where he says, wanting to eat men at the same time, afraid of being eaten themselves. They all look at each other with the deepest suspicion, how comfortable life would be for them if they could rid themselves of such obsessions and go to work, walk, eat and sleep at ease. They have only this one step to take. Yet fathers, sons, husbands, wives, brothers, friends, teachers, students, sworn enemies and even strangers have all joined in this conspiracy, discouraging and preventing each other from taking this step. The famous last line of it reads, perhaps there are still children who have not eaten men. Save the children. And this is the first and probably the most famous short story in modern Chinese literature and fiction. And it's a criticism of the Confucian ideals. The eating mm. of people is you've got more power or more authority over another person. Everyone's got their place. But why would we all subscribe to that? Yeah, you get the pleasure of ruling the household, mm. of looking after the child when they're growing up. And the child gets to look forward to eating men themselves. But wouldn't it be better if we just didn't have this strict hierarchy, which has been misappropriated from Confucius. I think we can save Confucius from some of these criticisms by modernizing it and rid ridding ourselves of some of the misogyny and stuff. But that traditional Confucianism, I mean, take some of the aspects of family life, which we were going to get onto last section, where family is a little society where we learn the natural hierarchy of the world. It's clear from Confucius, he, what does he say in one say? Quote, 1723, women and petty men are especially hard to handle. And uh, Gardner in his text writes, nowhere in the Analects or other texts is there the, even a suggestion that Confucian program for self-cultivation and moral perfection was applicable to women. Other sources I found, so the BBC's in our time, I think it's Francis Wood, one of the scholars on there, it might have been another one said that it, Confucian suggests that it's even better to let a woman drown than it is to touch her. Mm. People took this, so women didn't have a place in public life. They weren't able to take the exams. It was very rare in exceptional circumstances that had places in government. When they were given to another member of another family, they were now property of that family, or part, they lose their old family rather to become part of the new family. And how horrible this must have been, a quote again from Gardner, the loss of identity that came with this transition to the husband's family must have been traumatic for so many, and serving the new step-parents, uh, mm. new godparents mm. rather. And the only thing, good thing that can be said, I think, Andy, you mentioned this maybe two weeks worth of installments ago, that 
Yeah, they did have a role. Like they had the responsibility to educate the child, look after the house. They've got power as mothers. But I think for a lot of feminist philosophers reading today, that's going to be insult to injury. Oh, you do have power. It just has to be this thing. So the criticism, perhaps to tie this all together, is traditional Confucianism, unfortunately, lends itself quite nicely to men and those who can afford to be educated, retaining power, and everybody else, unfortunately, just sits in their place in the hierarchy. But you've got to do that. Yeah, and I think it's it's quite an interesting critique, right? So Confucianism doesn't have a, a pluralistic attitude towards living well. So a pluralist might say, you know, if you want to be a musician, if you want to be a a farmer, if you want to be a scholar, all of those things are are paths to your own individual happiness. If that's fulfilling for you, then good for you. That's that's great. The Confucian doesn't really agree, I guess, when you get down to the the nitty gritty. So there is a hierarchy to, to society. It is better to be a scholar than a farmer. You know, it is better to be a... Um, somebody in in a high position of political power than it is to be a merchant. Mm. That that hierarchy, you, we don't want to straw man Confucius. I think a lot of people see the hierarchy as ridiculously rigid and strong. I think some Confucians interpret it that way, but not all. I think that there is, if you read the Analects, Confucius does seem open to saying that you know there is a certain amount of common sense and respect and love and all that sort of thing. You know, with the virtues, you're not you're not just following the ruler unquestionably because he's literally questioning the rulers in his time himself, right, by cultivating these virtues. If you've got a tyrannical emperor, you're not just going to follow what they say because they're their emperor. You should be looking at them because they're not they're not cultivating Ren. How can we cultivate Ren? We shouldn't support them. However, I think that there is a, a, a massive issue here with the encouragement of social scripts. You know, mm-hmm. we spoke to Kate Mann quite recently about how, from the feminist perspective, how social scripts can be quite dangerous for women and men. So if we take the example of pain, right? So the idea that, you know, if we look at some of the statistics from America, women of color in America, for whatever reason, seem to have a much higher rate of death in childbirth um, than, than, than white women, that social scripts can sometimes get in the way and can like the, like the stereotype that men are more stoic when it comes to pain, men and boys compared to, to women and girls, that social scripts and institutions can, whether deliberately or not, harm people. And I think there is a, a train of thought within Confucianism, which is kind of saying, no, 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 the social script, you know, mourn for the three years. These are the things you need to do, that those social scripts are almost encouraged. And that actually in, in that kind of hierarchical structure, there can be a, a serious problem there where if you're following a social script, it might not necessarily make you happy that to be a Junzi for you may not be the same as being a Junzi for somebody else. You may mm. hate learning poetry. You can't stand it. And you've got to memorize like, loads of them 300 yeah. 300 right so I, th- I think that the, that that would be a genuine critique and i think you know those that idea of social scripts especially for some people are, some people are literally spending their entire careers trying to dismantle those things mm. and then the confusion says no if anything we need more of those things uh, i think that is a valid criticism yeah i think the the impo- the idea of looking at what the ideal might be and as we've mentioned saying well if we just modernize confucianism a little bit and change it then then there are lots of good seeds in there that could yeah. be could flourish the problem there is that we have the benefit of hindsight now where we can look back at history and see where certain things clearly didn't go the way in which I think a lot of people now, especially from a fem- feminist critique, are going to, to point to, mm-hmm. which is that through most of Chinese culture and arguably still today is that boys are prized mm. before girls as far as when when you want a child the at least traditionally speaking the male was the person who could take on the family mm. estate and and continue the work from the father the great happiness the, yeah and and the girls could only ever wish to become good wives to people of families in which their like their parents have agreed mm. to and so there's already that element and uh, I, I remember reading about the idea of female foot binding mm. and and that yeah. that became a huge part of Chinese culture that was only banned in the 20th century. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. lots of lots of people, women. If, just in case you haven't come across this idea before, that women's feet were wrapped up in, oh, and binding until it. it's, yeah, it's oh yeah, so like, like so it can yeah. re- really um, really mess up. Uh, so you wouldn't be able to to walk yeah. for the rest of your life if it if it ended really badly for you. But it became 
like an erotic fetish for some people and it was seen to be a, a, a view of keeping women submissive and mm. and the property of of their males and even some areas of china had real big problems with the male versus female population numbers so infanticide was practiced quite commonly during the uh, cultural revolution in mao's china in the world ch- one child policy where if a family could only have one child they'd really really want a boy to the point where some families may even commit infanticide and kill their female children which meant in some rural areas of china there was an overwhelming amount of boys and i think in some areas they said it was like 70 80 percent men 30 20 percent women which is not good then because then you've got especially if you're thinking of relationships and marriage it's it's not good and not that that is confucius's fault confucius never said foot bind to my knowledge or confucius never said you should commit infanticide but there we can see how the, that kind of idea of of social script and hierarchy can be taken potentially advantage of by certain institutions and authorities and that that can be quite dangerous on the, on the just an extra point on on the role of of men and women as well is that it when once you've come up with a quite a strict version of this is what a man looks like or this is what a woman looks like and then you start saying well and there are certain very prescribed ideas about what you can do it's unsurprising that people wouldn't end up kind of taking that and rolling with it there is a chinese uh, philosopher a, a woman called ban Zhao, uh, who uh, whose dates are 80 uh, so 48 to 116 ce uh, and she uh, a text called the ab, ab- a text called the admonitions uh, the admonitions for women and she mentions a whole bunch of things that is if you want to be a good kind of confucian woman this is the sort of thing that you should do Mm. so uh, good female conduct would involve womanly virtues of being chaste and modest womanly speech that is avoiding vulgar language and choosing one's words carefully knowing when it's appropriate to speak Mm. womanly manners keeping one's clothes and clean and fresh and womanly work weaving sewing and serving food and drink so there are clear clear prescribed roles that people should do of course men would also have prescribed roles and and you could say well certain things would benefit certain other in, in that way but i guess the point here is just saying that if for a lot of the average normal everyday people is, is that there were certain expectations that you would just have to do yeah. and that's that can quite easily be seen to link into the confucian way of life particularly when you stick in rituals and the importance of tradition in there as well if you mm. essentialize something so you know I, I water this plant and it grows and i inductively I've, i essentialize and say when i water the plant it grows and when i see lots of them I, I build up that inductive case and likewise when women are prescribed a certain role and then they always fulfill that role and then you know, they, they've been essentialized and that's what it should be going forward just sitting here kind of riffing and thinking about it i wonder how much of the old traditional confucianism you could throw out the window with hindsight and how much you could keep well, first of all, we want to avoid the philosophical mistake of, oh, Confucius was just the product of his time. He's just saying these things. Yeah, that's fine. Genetic explanation, but that's not a reason for thinking that it's right or that it's okay. Like it's still, if the feminist philosopher or, um, you know, even the example, I swear at one stage, it's like, I know this isn't the point of the example, it's for agricultural practice, but so the barn burns down, Confucius turns up and he asks other people yeah. and it specifically says he like, care about the horses. Yeah. <laughs> he, he did not ask about the horses. Like the opposite of Socrates. When, when, I, when I first horses. read that, I, I, I took that in a really weird way of just thinking, wait a minute, did he just not care that all of his horses died? And I just thought that, it cannot be the way that I was supposed to come across. <laughs> the meaning is he cared more about his people than the livelihoods. Yeah. yeah. But um, <laughs> in terms of hierarchy, natural order, you know, you can see how you might need to accommodate non-human animals and uh, women into your moral system. This is ethics in the sense of a fulfilled life, not ethics in the sense of trolley problems and mm. swamp monsters or whatever else. <laughs> is it swamp, swamp monsters? Swamp monster. ethic? <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting my thought. <laughs> swamp thing, so. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, how much can we get rid of? How much can we change it? I wonder if you break down these hierarchical structures, whether you can have much of Confucianism. Let, let, say, you, say you modernize it with women and non-human animals. Next, you turn your head, your head to metaethics and the kind of system we try to play out in part two. Is the metaethical view, heaven wants it this way, and that's where your objective moral value comes from, that the government should follow that, you should follow the government, you've got this trickle-down moral system. Once you get rid of heaven, and the government doesn't organise itself on the way of heaven, is the government supposed to just, uh, like, ha- is that going to work still? What are the thoughts? My take on that is that, so if we go back to the, the Schuntzer idea yeah. that 
okay, so we, we can get rid of heaven as the thing that mandates all of all of why we should be good. So the meta ethical question is not there is an objective standard of morality that we can follow and we can look back to the ancients and find that standard. Mm. He's just going to say, well, the standard is made up by human beings, but that doesn't make the standard any less important. Yeah. And there are probably certain objective factors that can be measured, like the fact that we know that human beings have certain things. And this is where the virtue ethics element comes in, which is there are certain ways that human beings flourish. And once we learn those through just being around other human beings, yeah. that we can, through the practice of Ren, learn to help cultivate themselves and everybody can grow to be the best versions of themselves and that i seem to think that that is perfectly adequate as, mm. a, as a way of living we don't need to have the other bits there how can we reconcile the hierarchy here's my answer to that whether or not it's good or not and it's not by the way this is not necessarily what i believe i just think it's what i picked up from reading which is that hierarchy is something that exists it's not something that people always like but it is a part of what every human society has almost ever experienced, apart from ways in which we socially construct a way to iron out as much hierarchy mm. as possible. Mm. In which case, going back to that relational self that Ollie mentioned a few episodes ago, is, is that we can understand the particular role that we have at any given moment. That role might change. I might improve. Confucius himself was an advocate of meritocracy. I can grow and, and eventually I might end up in a higher place on the hierarchy. I might not. Mm. But the point is, is that I should recognize that hierarchies exist and that I should then respect the role in which I have to play because it's kind of just the way in which society mm. it's the thing that oils the, the mechanisms of society. If everybody plays their role well, then everybody benefits. It's again, making a, a, another leap to the Western culture. It's, Plato was saying basically the same thing. Yeah. Justice is when all people know their place and do it correctly, mm. whether that's a good example when, of justice <laughs> yeah I'm, again i'm not saying this is what i believe Lost the king baby <laughs> <laughs> but but i think there is a there is a thread of truth to that where we think okay i have to accept certain things that i live in a society and that as long as i treat my uh, like the people in my life well and with respect that they deserve and the people show me the respect that i deserve and let's say let's say if i am in a position of of authority over someone that doesn't have to be a bad thing mm. like teachers might have to have authority over students people in government might have to have authority over the police or the yeah. or the or whatever ministry you want to talk about so it just helps people to make decisions and to make them easier if we mm. have a certain level of hierarchy i'm i'm with you completely and i think there's there's so much stuff that i really like about confucianism and i'm only giving some criticisms here to kind of balance it out can, uh, can i expand on yours jack are you going to talk about tradition because i've got something to really yeah yeah I was, I was just going to say in the book of rites we get things and are taken from the book of rites and the rituals that go forward yeah the teacher needs to have some kind of hierarchical structure against the student or else you're not going to have an effective learning. We've all been there. But the the point of the rituals going to the extent that I can't show you the inside of my clothing, I have to stand dead upright in front of my family members. Mm. I should never burp, cough, sneeze, scratch myself or do anything like that in front of my parents. Like That doesn't seem like a fulfilled, happy existence in, in my book, but yeah. No, and I, and I think that, that, but then that's where I think we can make some reasonable adjustments where we don't get rid of, we're not throwing out all of Confucian ideas. We can just revise yeah. what are the standards in which we would like to meet mm. and then do those. So I think a Confucian, a modern day Confucian might say it's still important that we respect our elders, uh, in particular our family members, even when we sometimes might find it difficult to be with them mm. because there are certain things that we kind of owe the people that look after us and stuff. Yep. Now, of course, that goes out of the window when we're talking about, say, somebody who is like abusive and horrible mm. to their children, because then the trust and the and the part of their role that they're supposed mm. to fulfill is not being fulfilled. And Confucius would agree with that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, Jack's really picked up on something that I really want to kind of mention, which I think is important. I think our dear listeners are listening. They're listening to these these criticisms. We're ripping Confucianism apart. I think that we shouldn't throw it all away just yet but i think there is something that jack mentioned that i want to kind of pick up on which idea of tradition mm. and it's important i think that we've been using some brilliant chinese thinkers and that it's very important that you our dear listeners understand that confucius wasn't just like accepted as like the golden awesome philosophy forever that we've mentioned it in episode one that confucianism came in and out of popularity throughout the hundreds of years in china one critic was mosey and the book the mosey from book nine has literally a chapter called anti-confucianism too so i'm going to quote 
uh, from that book and see what we can kind of think about this. So this is a critique of the idea of, of traditionalism. Remember, we mentioned it before that Confucius is a thinker who's looking to the past. Mm. He thinks that if we look to the past, that is a way to help us get to a truer sense of harmony than there is in the present. He says, quote, in, in the Analect 7-1, I transmit rather than creating. So what does it say in the Mosey? So this is anti-Confucianism 2, 39-5. Quote, the Confucianist says the superior man conforms to the old, but does not make innovations. We answer him in antiquity. Ye invented the bow. You invented armor. Zi Zhao invented vehicles and Chao Chi invented boats. Would he say the tanners, armorers and carpenters of today are all superior men? Whereas Yi, Yu, Zhi, Zhong and Chao Chi were all ordinary men? Moreover, some of those whom he follows must have been inventors mm. when his instructions are, af are after all the ways of the ordinary men. So it's kind of like a long list of, of people that invent things. Well, what's it saying? Well, it's saying that Confucius is saying that these people invented all these brilliant things, right? Mm. Bows, armor, boats. What about now? What about the, the modern texts, institutions, inventions, ideas? Democracy, right? A lot of people would say democracy is a very Confucian idea in a lot of ways. I mean, Confucius doesn't promote democracy. He promotes a paternal monarchy, ultimately. He's saying that one guy at the top, brilliant leader, everything's going to be fine. So I think that this is quite a valid criticism. The idea of, okay, well, you can look to the past, but what about the, the change that's happening now that almost fulfills your ideas in a better way than those ones from the past. Mm. You know, I would say like a modern Confucian probably in a way should believe in democracy, right? That, that that's surely in some sense is better than a paternalistic monarchy and more in keeping with Confucian ideals that anybody can develop Gen Z. They may argue in response to that and say that maybe the politicians still need to practice that kind of virtue to be, you know, noble leaders and rule by example, etc. But I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think a Confucius would uh, believe in something like democracy? To an extent. I know that there are definitely elements where Confucius in the Analects suggests that you can oppose leadership in the right way mm. and that that is not opposed. So you can imagine a system where there is a, a leadership group and there's an opposition and there are checks and balances to stuff. But you get the impression, at least at least from the classical sense, that Confucius rules for the people, but not by the people. Mm. And that there's only a certain group of people who can aspire to become these gentlemen or sages, although hopefully everybody might be able to do so. But let's say, realistically speaking, we want the best of the best yeah. at the top. It might fall down to that problem of are people going to be easily led by promises made by people who don't have their best interests at heart? And I think there is an undercurrent with so much of what Confucius says that it just doesn't seem to appeal to democracy. Do I think it's possible to change some of those ideas for the modern world? Yeah, quite possibly. But I don't know what, at what point we then just lose the essence of Confucianism. I think there's loads of little rabbit holes and things and, and points which we go on discussing uh, for, a, for a while here. I like what you've, you both mentioned there in terms of I think, Andrew, you've just said this pretty well, that you need certain things in order to uh, be uh, a sage. You can't just, yeah, it's for everybody, but you need material goods for a start so you can start thinking about morality. So the ruler needs to make sure that our material needs are met. But you also need the enthusiasm to learn as well. You need to be born in the right part. And I quite like this because just like our boy Aristotle, says that we need lots of things in order to cultivate the good life, because this is a holistic idea of the human being with them at the centre. Well, the community at the centre for, for Confucius. But at the same time, this, just like Aristotle, this doesn't leave the right taste in your mouth. Am I only, am I only able to be virtuous or think about virtue if I have material goods? You can see you know, this playing out in the real world if you've got to worry about sheep being on the dinner table your old man might be robbing them on the weekend and you might not be able to think about virtue but you know maybe i want to live a fulfilled life despite the fact that i'm having to you know run a dog fighting ring do a phd and run a podcast at the same time and you know, if you're saying that i know how you feel like <laughs> we've all been there um what's my point my point is that i want to be able to live a fulfilled life and reach my human purpose given to me by heaven without mundane things like material goods. So maybe thinking about Taoism, I'm trying to draw some comparison to the last series we've done. For the Taoist, follow nature, right? And a part of nature is government, is engaging in a society. So they're not too far apart than mm. what first meets the eye. The way is to live in accordance with the natural Tao, which is the great Tao, 
and a part of that is to engage in society. Well, for Confucius, a part of the Tao is the great Tao, i.e. heaven, which is to engage in society. But that society just happens to be hierarchical. So you might look at them both and think, well, for the Taoist, I don't need material goods, but I live a fulfilled life. But for Confucius, I do need the material goods, and that's part a necessary feature of engaging with the Tao. Now, Confucius might just be right. Like hierarchy is a part of the the natural order. Maybe the Tao is right. Maybe hierarchy isn't, and we just need to Wu Wei and all that jazz. We've- I was, oh, sorry, I was going to just say. I think Confucius would probably disagree with you to an extent, where he's going to say even the poorest of my disciples yeah. is able to nurture themselves and to become virtuous. But I think pragmatically speaking, mm. people can't worry about being ethical if they're starving to death. And so there is a certain hierarchy of needs that can, can has to get reach a level where we can then start thinking about what can I do to others what or for others more, more reasonably, yeah. rather than thinking for ourselves. And yeah, you're quite right. I think that a certain material wealth, it doesn't have to be loads. Mm. Anybody can aspire to be better than they are, but to be a, to be a sage or a genre, surely you need a bit of a bit of help along the way yeah it's it's not a problem unique to confucius either is it you can only think it, it's a reason why that mm. criticism of oh you're only able to give to charity you're only able to choose that dietary thing and it's like middle class or upper class morality where you know you don't have to worry about these literally keep my children alive no i can't go and volunteer at the soup kitchen on the weekend and give half of my money to charity i'm literally trying to keep my close friends and family alive so you can see that playing out and the criticism that moral philosophy and ethics is for a particular class and type of person uh, i think that may be a valid one against confucius and for, mm. for what we do here moral and, and ethics morality and ethics question i'm not sure if this is facetious in fact i'm pretty sure it is facetious is this <laughs> but the, i'm gonna say anyway <laughs> is this the pinnacle of like human society and life so when you read confucius that's your purpose to fit into the system and the best thing society can do is this my my thinking is like is this really utopia is this the is it, confucius is saying this is the best we can do this system is what we should all aspire to the historian might say no Confucius is trying to give this for a certain time and place. He's trying to give security and stability and the best we can do, just like the Taoists in a time of of, of massive unrest and war and death and so on. But if you try to take a universal truth from it, like the philosopher of the 21st century rather than the historian, Mm -hmm. then... I, 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 my suspicion is, and I'm not going to go into a theory of what we could do otherwise, just a question, genuinely, can't we do better? <laughs> yeah, well, yes, I believe quite possibly, but if I could give my most generous account of the Confucian utopia, as it were, and let's, let's get rid of some of the gender hierarchy and say that, say, every single person, man or woman, could become some sage and that we can reject that element of it. I think Confucius says in the Analects that he's convinced that we could, with a hundred years of good rule, do away with the need of strict mm. authoritarian punishment because mm. eventually it would be so much of the culture that people would have, as we've discussed, that healthy sense of shame and people would want to do the best for others and want to help people grow. And in a loose utopian sense, I can't think of a much better society to live in where people genuinely with uh, wholeheartedly have a healthy sense of respect for other people to the sense that they genuinely want them to improve and they Mm. want to see Mm. other people succeed because often enough people don't always feel that way people have a sense of this is zero sum if i'm not winning i'm losing and if other people are winning i'm losing and that means that we resent others for doing well in the confucian utopia i'm happy for my fellow person when they succeed because they're doing well and somebody would also praise me for my 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 rise in success if if and when that comes and i think that's a healthy nice approach to other human beings where Mm. we don't all have to be in horrible competition with one another and we respect people's positions when they earn it by their merit of course that is so hard (laughs) to achieve and maybe some people would say just outside of the limits of what human beings are capable of but I think that sounds nice. I'm hardwired to pass on my <laughs> genetics and it's going to be really hard for me not to do the things that put me higher up in that 
hierarchy above others competing with uh, the other males or something. And I think Yong Huang in this A Guide for the Perplexed on um, Confucius posted by Bloomsbury, which is really good, and we all uh, dipped into it and read it for today's episode. I think he says something along the lines of how to love virtue as much as you love sex. But And Confucius says, I've never met anybody who loves virtue more than they love sex. So c- can we really expect all of society to put passing on their genes below you know, helping uh i'm going to say something facetious so i'm just going to <laughs> well, i'll give i'll give the confucian answer back to that as well is, is that confucius didn't take the and we said this before already the jesus approach of universal love for all he's quite pragmatic and says you should love and care for the people who you're closest to in proximity and the people mm. who care for you most because the the idea that you would obviously want to help your friends more because they've helped you seems natural within the human capacity of what we're able mm. to do as good people mm-hmm. And it makes us feel good about ourselves. I much rather spend the company with my good friends and do nice things with them than helping a stranger on the street, because ultimately I have feel a much stronger sense that I owe my friends more than them. And mm. some people might say, I mean, so the utilitarian might say, well, that's wrong. But as a human being, I feel more inclined to do that anyway. So perhaps mm. that's an easier expectation mm. that we can meet. There is. Of uh, utilitarian Confucianism, which would bridge those. Of course, yeah. Those I, moments, I mean, so. like in the yeah. in the like the abstract, simple utilitarian. Yeah. But absolutely, yeah. You can. There are so many ways for a utilitarian to realise that potential. I, I think mm. if we can jump into some concluding remarks, then just to start kicking us off here, mm. is that like Aristotle, I think that Confucius, you can take a load of Confucian principles and bring them to your own moral philosophy, and it's compatible with a lot of the things which we hold to be true now in the light of other uh, moral philosophy that we've done, and that we can modernise it in lots of other ways. I think what I like about Confucius is that he looks to the past and asks us what philosophical lessons that we can learn, and to to be really cliche here, that's kind of what we're doing now, isn't it? <laughs> we're looking to the past to Confucius to see what we can learn, and there is loads that we can learn, particularly on a personal level. I don't think we've emphasised this. There's a reason why, I don't say this in a derogatory way, why Confucius quotes are tweeted and put in Facebook posts and printed onto things. They're there because they actually make you reflect on the world. They might not be rich, like, truths objectively philosophically speaking but they certainly inspire you to be more virtuous and think about what's valuable in your life and there are loads of brilliant quotes which can make us reflect make us think about what it is to be virtuous and Mm. one example zygong says should a person be loved by all people and Confucius says no should a person be hated by people says that won't do either the bad people should despise him and the good people should love him and that's that's a really beautiful poetic piece of getting you to think about your reputation in the world here's another if one demands much from oneself and places little responsibility on others then one will keep discontent at bay and maybe a bit of conservatism here but focus on improving yourself and being mm. virtuous yourself don't worry about resenting person x or y for not doing the washing up or not doing as much as you do in society and being lazy. You focus on yourself. Like there's there's practical things you can do here. A last one, it is surely difficult to spend the whole day stuffing oneself with food and having nothing to use one's mind on. And there are not people who play bow and you. Even such activity is definitely superior, is it not? So here again, like we don't just sit around and do nothing. We want to engage our minds. We want to think. We want to engage in reasoning and so on. And so these are really nice poetic ways of thinking about what it is to live a good life. Hmm. Like, if you take some of the passages, are they true with a capital T? Probably not, but they sound really good. And they, <laughs> like, they, they for, I read the Analects as if here's a nice classroom, here's a great lesson which I'm watching. I might read a book, I might read some Shakespeare, I might watch a really good film, and that might make me think about morality and ethics and so on. So mm. I read the text like that, and I think mm. there's something really important to, to take from it. Um, mm. I'm a Confucian hierarchical person who doesn't care if horses die in, <laughs> in blazing infernos. I'm not sure I'm, I'm, not sure I'm there <laughs> that's yet. That's the day going. Yeah, but I'd say, I'm pretty sure that's the main thing <laughs> Confucius said. Um, that's a really nice concluding remark there, Jack. Uh, mine's quite interesting. I mean, any 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 philosopher we look at who says that you know, learning is really important, I've always got a bit of a soft spot for, I think. really like the idea that Confucius promotes a lifelong journey of self-cultivation. I think 
we would all agree that that's not a bad thing. Uh, I'm going to come at this from quite a different angle, I think. So I'm politically, like a lot of people at the moment, very, very frustrated and angry and annoyed with lots of things uh, on the left wing and the right wing for lots of very, very different reasons. And I, whenever I teach anything to do with politics, I always go, people on the left and people on the right, they ultimately want the same thing. They want a society full of healthy, happy people just going about their business. I've always said that, but I've never believed it. Um, <laughs> I've, for many, many years, really, really struggled with right-wing ideas. I just don't understand them and conservative values generally. I, I consider myself quite left-leaning in a lot of my politics and a lot of the things I, I believe to be true. And I've just never understood, really, why someone would have more right-wing or more conservative values. I've just, they just never really made sense in my head. Until I've started reading some Confucius, I feel like... If you are going to take the traditionalist approach, the more conservative approach to society, the idea that you have a small government uh, with a with a like a l not very many restrictions on on society, the idea that um, you trust people to make the right decisions and act in a good way, so there doesn't have to be lots of intervention. I feel like if that was Confucianism, then mm. I'd be okay with that. I like the idea that. For Confucius, he says that it's, it's down to every individual and every kind of relationship that you have with somebody else to cultivate the, the most amount of, of goodness or the most of ren. Sometimes, you know, you can be in a, in, a, in, a, in a public place or in a situation where you think, if people just behave themselves, we wouldn't have to do any of this rubbish. I'll take a really, really silly example that's very, very minor. But if you go to like a gig in the UK, legally now you can't be served a glass glass it has to yeah. be in plastic. I hate the plastic why does it have to be served in plastic because some insert bleep here just decides to chuck glass everywhere and hurt people not everybody it'd be a few minority but because of that few minority the rest of us have to drink out of plastic mm. cups now is that a really serious ethical debate in the 21st century no not at all but, but some it should be <laughs> <laughs> and i'm going to make it my life's mission <laughs> yeah and, and, I, and i and i tend to think that you know if if people did have that sense of of, of a, of like, like Andy was mentioning earlier, like this sense that we're all here to try and better each other, that we have the person in charge who is a noble person, the best possible mm. person, a, a moral exemplar who is forward thinking, kind, conscientious, generous, thoughtful, intelligent, that if we had that, then that would be, I could kind of understand why someone might have more conservative views because you would look at that person and leaders have influence, that people mm. do look to them, whether it's wearing a mask during a pandemic or the way they talk to other people, the way they appreciate the history and cultural or multicultures of a society. I think that if you had a leader like that, then I could understand why someone might feel that that is the way to have a healthy, happy society. Mm. And I think it's quite interesting that I feel like a lot of kind of more right-leaning politicians, and, and certainly in the West at the moment, don't even come close to that. They're on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, which I think is quite interesting in a lot of ways. You know, if you look at someone like Boris Johnson, not to name drop him, but he doesn't, certainly doesn't strike me as a Gen Z. You know, his whole persona is a, is a you know, a babbling buffoon. And I, and, I th and I think that if there were conservatives out there that kind of truly embodied that idea of that Confucian ideal of, of virtue and truly put their money where their mouth is, mm. led by example, and encouraged others to do so, I, I could kind of see why someone would, would agree with that. So more, I guess, kind of reflection on my own thought process with that. There is a type of conservatism out there that and now I'm like, oh, OK, I, I get why someone would, would, would kind of vote mm. for that or approve of that. In terms of Confucius himself, uh, you know, great quotes, love it. Um, you know, I think that the Analex is, is brilliant. Um, I, I, I really think that a lot of the a lot of the ways we approach. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Ollie put his arms up there. <laughs> now I've discussed what I think. Uh, yeah. Confucius, yeah, yeah. sure. I, I guess. I, I, what I think, I, I view, sorry, I view, I view, I view Confucius great. the same way you view Socrates, right? Like he 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 raises some really interesting questions that when you you pose them, they they question your thinking. Even our little conversation we had about the sheep, we had it on microphone and we had it off microphone as well. Like, it's an interesting example. It mm. gets you to think a little bit. And, and I think that that's worth it. And, you know, the fact that we have br branched out and explored some Chinese philosophy, I'm really, uh, really just really enjoyed diving into a, a different culture's philosophical systems, not just comparing it to, to Western philosophers, but seeing how the, the metaphysics and everything connects together. It's been a really enjoyable experience. Mm. So I'm not, I'm not a Confucian. 
I'm not converted. And if you are, that's great. But I think that he's certainly <laughs> worth studying. And I think that if you're serious about philosophy and you're going to claim that, you know, you want to do philosophy, I think you need to do some Confucius. Mm. Well, th- just a sign that I should have put in my concluding remarks. I didn't enjoy reading the Analects, I should say. And I meant it at the start. I enjoyed the secondary reading more. Rec- what would you recommend? Do you recommend reading the Analects first? Have you got a... Just, I mean, just I would read it cover to cover because I didn't do that. I kind of hopped between it and other texts. You, I think personally, you if you are interested in learning about Confucius... You almost don't need to read the Analects as such. I still recommend doing it because you get to get through all of it and not just the bits mm. that people have selected. But the fact is, is that because it's not systematic, other people have done that job for you. Mm. So they've written a book and then they get the themes and then they say, well, here are some passages from the Analects that match these themes. And it just helps you piece it all together. As you said, I think in the first episode is because it's not at least originally wasn't in chapters and, yeah, and it's all over the place the that I would actually say find an introduction first you mm. you'll learn all of the stuff that we've been talking about during this these episodes mm. and then check out the analytics yeah, the yourself. twist at the end isn't worth it to be honest yeah. uh, Daniel Gardner's Confucianism short introduction was one of the best short introductions yeah, I think yeah, I read. it was yeah. really yeah, really good, good wasn't it so I'd say start with that if you're looking to to dive into things a little bit more depth let's dive into Andrew's concluding remarks into a little bit more depth I'm again. I'm going to try and give my best defence of a type of Confucianism, mm. uh, because while I certainly don't think of myself as a Confucianist, that I think or a Confucian, there is there are some really good bits. One, I think, for the time in which he was living in, and I know he wouldn't have been the only person, but such fantastic insights into moral psychology. Mm-hmm. He's not prescribing normative ethics in the way in which a lot of uh, people will learn about in universities and schools today. He, I mean, we've always said throughout the, the series, it's virtue ethics. But the fact that he he nails it instantly and says it's about moral character and the way you're influenced by leadership and by your role models and that the people that you're around you will begin to mimic because that's kind of part of human nature yeah. so find friends that have your back and want to you want the best for you and to improve yourself and you should want to improve them too in a healthy non-judgmental way and you can equally try and do that as a parent try and instill your child with a true fascination of the world and respect for others and to see your place of part of a wider whole that again hard to argue against and i think perhaps the one of the best bits is trying to do the right thing for the right reason so we said with the rituals don't just go through the motions and do something try and cultivate a real sense that this is this matters having a certain reverence for the world and for people and uh, on the on that note as well so on the Confucius uh, Guide for the Perplexed by Yong Wang, uh, he actually he references a really great example uh, from a philosopher, Michael Stocker. Uh, I'm just going to read this as a bit to finish my bit off. And this is about the way in which you would perhaps react to a friend doing something that was potentially moral. Mm-hmm. So he says, suppose you're in a hospital recovering from a long illness. You're very bored and restless and at loose ends when Smith say one of your friends Hmm. comes in once again so we can assume that smith has been making regular visits you're now convinced that more than ever that he is a fine fellow and a real friend taking so much time to cheer you up traveling all the way across town and so on you're so effusive with your praise and thanks that he protests and says that he always tries to do do his duty and what he thinks is best the more you two speak the more clear it becomes that it's not essentially because you think that he's come to see you uh, because you're friends it's that he basically does it because he feels obliged to have to do so Mm. And the point that that Stocker is making here is is that we like it when people come and help us because they genuinely are our friends yep. and care about us. Mm. And I think ethically, in a way, that does matter. It's not just the fact that somebody does an empty gesture. Is that they that it matters to you as a person that somebody has taken the time out of their day because they care about you. Mm. And if Again, I said this earlier, but if everybody tried to just do that a little bit more, then you could imagine how communities could begin to to get a little bit more of that sense that everyone is actually truthfully out for everybody else to a healthy way. Because I'm not going to say that everybody has to put everything on their life on hold to help others, because that's unreasonable. And Confucius never argues for that to be the case. But there are certain steps that Confucianism sets to say, this would be a really nice way if everybody lived. Mm -hmm. Now, that's my good side of it. The final point then, I guess, is should we all adopt Confucianism? 
not in a lot of the ways that Confucius argues, because yeah. I think I I do think there is it's so <laughs> likely that nepotism and 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 a, a lack of uh, wondering about how things could change could be in place, and so cultures mm. as we've seen throughout history can stagnate and, yeah. and bad ideas become entrenched, and I think we have to take a healthy skepticism towards that type of thing. But I think as a philosophy, a way of life, you should certainly adopt some Confucian ideas. Someone who's been adopting some ideals on the Pantsidecast is Mr. Ollie Marley, who's hosting this installment's Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Pop 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 Philosophy Quiz. Welcome to Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz. Uh, Ollie, you hosted one before in the past. You hosted one with Peter Adamson, if you remember. I I can't remember. Do you fancy doing the Buddhism one? Andrew. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. So we each do one for our little mini-series on, on Chinese philosophy. I think that'll be good fun. Uh, so no pressure, Ronnie. Uh, do you want to take... You, you host... Sorry, I, I'm just I'm just naturally... I mean, I would host it if you let me, Jack. <laughs> it's hard to let go of power <laughs> once you've got it, isn't it? Okay, That's so... We've got the hierarchy. We are doing everyone's part of the show. Uh, <laughs> it's that pop, thing pop. that happens at the end of the series. <laughs> Pop-up philosophy quiz. So I'm going to do this slightly differently than Jack does it. And I'm sorry that this it might take me a while to get the quotes. So I've got a bunch of quotes. Okay. The quotes aren't going to be from, I normally you have like two or three different sources. They're going to be- Always e- three. They're either going to be from a philosopher that we have studied. So Confucius, <laughs> yeah. Lao Tzu, even maybe some Mosey, maybe even some Jesus. <gasps> but you probably much have to guess if it's that or if it's Yoda. Okay. So that old uh, classical Chinese philosopher Yoda has some very, very important quotes and sayings. Some of them might be really obvious. Some of them might not be. So uh, I'm going to have to trust Jack to keep the score. Oh, I've got what, hold so what? No, you can't. <laughs> what do you mean? Can I have a piece of paper then? Yeah, you can have it. There's a pen. Thanks. <laughs> There's some paper. I'm very prepared, by the way. What's going on it? Yeah, so just to be clear then. So can can we then... Uh, uh, what yeah. do you want us to say? So, oh, yeah, first, first of all, right, so, do, do we get a Yoda. point for identifying the right person? So or you, can you I just can say, two, that's not Yoda? You can, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because obviously so, yeah. I might not so, be able to identify it. Two, 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 points, rubber, rubber. two points per quote. <laughs> first one for saying it's either Yoda or not Yoda. So you either say Yoda or not Yoda. And then you can get a bonus point if you can tell me who it is. Right, okay. Cool. right? Yeah. Go for it. I like that we're keeping the pace here as well to keep listening. Sorry, go on. I'm, I'm... Love is of all the passions the strongest, for it attacks simultaneously the head, the heart, and the senses. It is not Yoda. Who is it? I'm not sure. Is there? A, it could be anybody. Any people I've mentioned before. So Confucius, Jesus, or Lao Tzu? Or Mosey, yeah. Or Mo- it's Mosey. No, it's not. It's Lao Tzu. One no. point for Jack. That's not too bad. Right, next quote. Are we ready? That's uh, lousy. Failure is the greatest teacher. Yoda. It is Yoda. Well done, Andy. One point each. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's go with the next one. You must unlearn what you have Not learned. Yoda. Uh, Yoda? Yeah, uh, it is Yoda. Well done. Oh, yeah. He looks at me there just like... <laughs> oh, come on, you need to listen, right? Um, <laughs> what do you mean you've got to listen? A gentleman right? would never Not wear scarlet Yoda. at Not, home. Not Yoda. That's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Andy. Two points for Andy. <laughs> This is really good. I'm enjoying this. Um, <laughs> uh, three things cannot be long hidden. The sun, the moon, and the truth. Not Yoda. Yep. And that's Lao Tzu. It's not Lao Tzu. Damn. That was Buddha. We haven't done that yet, though, so that's kind of cheating. You didn't say Buddha was on the list. Yeah, I did. Okay, so <laughs> listen, Jack, you're rubbish at this. <laughs> um, avoid awesome? evil like your hand avoids boiling water. Not Buddha. No, so not, not Yoda. Buddha, not Yoda. I've got to give it. You said not Buddha, so I'm going to give it to Andy. It's not the Buddha, though, is it? Who is it? It's Confucius. Confucius, it is. You just gave him the point. Why'd you do that? Because <laughs> he's a good Confucius. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see Andy yeah. five, <laughs> five two. Five two. Right. Um, okay, right, I'm here. Um, I'm going. let's go with. How many? We got a few left. Have we? Yeah, we still got. I've got a chance. Um, I'm mm-hmm. going to power through now. Andy. Those who exalt themselves not will be humbled. And that's Confucius. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Uh, you're right, it's not Yoda, but it's Jesus. So you don't get the extra point, not too bad. Um, train yourself to let go of Yoda. everything Yoda. you fear to Yoda. lose. Is it Yoda? <laughs> it is Yoda, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if this one. is offensive or like you put all the religious <laughs> figures fine. next to Yoda. Uh, uh, wars do not make not one great. Yoda. And that is, oh, that, I think that is Confucius. No. Damn it. It's Lao Tzu. It's Yoda, boys. Damn it. Wars do not make one great is Yoda. <laughs> Last one. You were doing well. Um, yeah, if one does not preserve the learned in a state, he will be injuring the state. Confucius. 
That's not Yoda or not Yoda. So, not Yoda. Yep. And I'm going to actually say Lao Tzu. Oh, it's Mosey. Ah, yeah, but, okay. so, who, who won? Okay, so the current is Jack with three, Andy with eight. Oh, good. There's no such thing as I in Confucianism. Yeah. <laughs> We're all part of It's a plurality of, of people. <laughs> and the, the master, the sage. I enjoyed, I enjoyed that very much. That was quite fun to host. Yeah, looking forward to Andrew's. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Cullen St. Gabriel's and Westall Endowment for their continued support. Without the support of Cullen's Westall and our patrons, it would be incredibly difficult for us to keep producing the weekly instalment of the show. We're in our fifth year of the show. Woo! We've been doing this for ages. And if Woo! you've been enjoying the show for as long as we've been enjoying making it, then please, patreon.com forward slash pansycast. In particular, a very special thank you to the man nurturing the sprouts of virtue is St. David Ligeness. Applauding from the roadside during every royal parade, it's Mr. Dylan Kirby. The woman who always performs the correct rituals during the cycle of the five phases, Miss Lily Hooper. He understands that flavour serves to promote the circulation of cheese, your boy, Mr. T. The spirit who demands you sacrifice your autonomy for tradition, it's Mr. Jimmy Casperson. You bet he subscribes to the theory of the rectification of names, it's Ron <laughs> Van de Gogh. Forget respecting your elders, it's Mr. Adam Cool, and the man who would jump into a well to save a drowning child, the Confucian sage himself, Mr. Jim Clare. Patrons already have exclusive access to next week's instalment in which we start our exploration of Buddhism as well as the after show, which we're about to record. So head over there. Links in the description. Thank you. You've been listening to the wonderful, beautiful, soothing voices of Mr. Ollie Marley. Do not worry that other people do not know you, but be concerned that you do not know them. Mr. Jack Sines. As to myself being a gentleman in practice, I have never managed to achieve that. And me, Mr. Andrew Horton. The sage and we are of the same kind. So, either of you want to buy a sheep? <laughs> I've just recently acquired a sheep by means that I'm not prepared to discuss. Maybe you should uh, hand that sheep into the police, Jack. <laughs> Do you want to buy it and promise not to tell my dad that you got it from me? <laughs> Also, the other day, my uh, stables burnt down to the ground. <laughs> I can't say I cared. For oh, no questions from me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs>